Well, good morning, friends. I want to welcome you. Welcome to Cornerstone Presbyterian Church. I'm delighted that you're here with us uh, today. Welcome live stream. Uh, as you join us, we want to welcome in the name of Christ as we enter into his presence, the one who calls us to himself, calls us by name, and gives us his welcome. Um, I'm Tony Giles, one of the pastors. If you are new among us, we would love to be able to say hello to you and contact you if you would allow that. And there is a uh, place where you can do that. In the back of this bulletin in your hands, the next to last page, there's a QR code where your camera can take you to a site where you can leave contact information. We'd love to uh, know how to um, contact you and, and serve you in any ways that we can. Uh, but welcome. Uh, there's a couple of announcements. There's several, actually, uh, but I want to call your attention to two. Right inside that back cover, if you would turn and look with me, um, two things I want to mention today. Well, men, this one is for you, and on Tuesday, February 2nd, the men's study group, a book group, uh, resumes with a new book uh, that you can pick up today. Uh, that is a gathering that takes place on a Tuesday morning early at Biscuit Love right next door. And you are invited to join with others that uh, read a book together and benefited from that dialogue uh, last, uh, at the end of last, through the last semester, last fall, and a new study begins. The book uh, this time around is entitled The Beautiful Community by Erwin Entz, subtitled Unity, Diversity, and the Church at Its Best. Uh, we invite you into that uh, dialogue uh, Tuesday mornings, February 2nd, books available right up these steps right here today. Um, Sunday school has resumed today, and if you are here, you might have been at Sunday school children in the last hour, but if not, if you uh, would want to join into that next week, we invite you parents uh, to register those children, and the way that occurs is up these steps down this hall toward the coffee back there, and then down the back flight of steps to register your children. That's a different way, a different route than you've had in the past, uh, dropping your children off at classes and then up there forming a loop. That's the, that's the traffic flow and the registration plan for children and youth are uh, at Meredith's Adults right here. You missed, uh, the, if you are just joining us, you missed the first of a three-part series uh, you are welcome to join into that, a discussion, a, a dialogue around this notion of built to last, enduring faith for turbulent times. Nate is taking uh, us through this together uh, with the, the cornerstone vision in mind. Is what does it look like to live out the vision that the Lord has given this church and, and um, the church at large in this turbulent time, uh, which is certainly that invite you to join, um, join with those that gathered this morning uh, in, the weeks, in the three weeks ahead. Uh, take a look at the other uh, things mentioned here, but we're delighted that you're a part of our gathered worship this morning. Welcome. Thank you, Tony. Well, it's appropriate, as Tony was mentioning just a second ago, the Sunday school class that we just finished uh, on enduring faith in turbulent times. Well, we actually find in the passage this morning that the Lord is... Uh, has us in, in our ongoing study of the Gospel of Mark, that the disciples come upon turbulent times in the text that's within us uh, that we'll treat this morning. But what you'll see is they don't have faith in that moment. Their faith, in fact, does not endure. What actually happens is that fear overtakes them. It could be that fear has overtaken you in this, uh, in this turbulent time, the storm that has been uh, brewing in and around in the context of our own culture, but maybe even the storms that may be brewing in your own life. Uh, maybe they've been there a long time. Maybe there's a fierceness about the squall even right now as you enter into the presence of the Lord. What is it like to maintain faith in a fretful moment in a crisis that continues to persist, how can we hold fast to the truth in the midst of the swirl? Well, that's part of the question we are asking and seeking to answer this morning as we look at Mark chapter 4, verses 35 to 41, a classic passage, which if you were raised at all in the church, there was no way you escaped without uh, exploring. It is indeed the passage where Jesus calms the storm on the Sea of Galilee. 
Well, as we enter into the presence of the Lord right now and ask for his help and his blessing by grace, prayerfully as we enter into praise, uh, ask the Lord to bring the great calm of salvation into your heart and life even now. To assure you of promises that might be very difficult for your mind to grasp and your heart to embrace right now. But let that calm be to you a confidence that's assured in truth. Not superficial because of circumstances. A calm that's come from knowing the Lord of the circumstances. The God who can be trusted in the midst of the storm. Because that God is here right now. And he meets with his people in the truth of his word by the power of his spirit. May his presence be to you a calm and a comfort in the midst of the storm. Let's worship him with that in view. Let's stand and let's sing together. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. The voice of the Lord is over many waters. The God of glory thunders. The Lord over many waters. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is full of majesty. The Lord sits enthroned over the flood. The Lord sits enthroned as king forever. May the Lord give strength to his people. May the Lord bless his people with peace.
Old Testament reading comes from Psalm 65, verses 1 through 8. Praise is due to you, O God in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed. O you, hear prayer, to you shall all flesh come. When iniquities prevail against me, you atone for our transgression. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple. By awesome deeds you answer us with righteousness, O God of our salvation, the hope of all the ends of the earth and the farthest seas. The one who by strength established the mountains, being girded with might, who stills the roaring of the seas, the roaring of the waves, the tumult of the peoples, so that those who dwell in the ends of the earth are in awe at your signs. You make the going out of the morning and the evening to shout for joy. This is the word of the Lord. Please be seated. There is a proverb that I will return to from time to time. It goes like this. Whoever conceals his transgression will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will obtain mercy. In those words, the the proverb invites us, no, really calls us and warns us about the danger of concealing those things that are so beneath the surface in our own lives that we're not even quite alert to them. You see, there's a tendency in your heart and mind to conceal. In fact, it's such a tendency that it becomes an, a commitment on our part to conceal some things. The reason we (laughs) tend to do so and to cover over those things is not so much to hide them from God, who already knows, but to even conceal them from ourselves. About that proverb, John Stott writes, we are in love with the fantasy image of ourselves which we have created. We refuse to escape from our dreamland. We imagine things to be true of us, and and there is something right in bringing them forth to be able to, to see before our own eyes and to come to terms with the reality of this story. That's what we do when we confess our sin. That instead of covering them over, which which is perilous to our spiritual health. It's an invitation into the light of day and beauty and glory. That's the path that we walk when we confess our sins. And we do so today using some words prepared for us from Psalm 81, talking specifically about idols of our hearts and a refusal to listen to the one who made us. Let's use these words to walk that path. 
Lord, we come confessing. Like the people of Israel, you relieved our shoulders of our burden. You freed our hands. In distress, we called and you delivered us. You answered our prayers. You call us to hear you as you admonish us, but we are slow to listen. There are strange gods among us. We bow to the idols in our hearts. Would that we would listen to your voice, that we would submit to you. You give us over to our stubborn hearts to follow our own counsels. Oh, that we would listen to you and walk in your ways. Subdue our enemies, subdue our hearts and thoughts to conform to your desires. Feed us with the finest wheat and satisfy us with honey from the rock. Father, our own story is such that we have at times been overwhelmed by our own sin, so much so that we creatively deny it and try to create that kind of self-protection from ourselves. Father, we tremble at the injury that that comes to our manufactured self-esteem our own self-righteousness and when that is jeopardized we we get creative and we move toward denial and in your mercy you awaken us you awaken us to see not only what we are so reluctant to see and to own. But in your goodness, that very move of our own hearts and acknowledgement is what draws you to us. Oh, Father, thank you that, that we can bring our sin into the light of day, that we can come clean about our sin before you who know all. And so we do come acknowledging that we have not listened to your voice, that our hearts are indeed stubborn and we follow our own counsels. But in your presence and with your mercy, we begin to hear again today the whisper of love, the whisper that comes to us in our need, that meets us in our brokenness, and restores us to newness of life and lifts our gaze to see in the face of the Father who loves us forgiveness and a smile. It is to you we come through Christ our Lord in whose name we pray. Amen. From Psalm 65, hear these words. When iniquities prevail against us, you atone for our transgressions. Blessed is the one you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, the holiness of your temple. By awesome deeds, you answer us with righteousness, O God of our salvation, the hope of all the ends of the earth. And that hope is yours, friends, because the reality is that the sins that we uncover are now covered not by our own ingenuity, but by his forgiveness. In that joy, in that newness, in that assurance, let us stand and with the ends of the earth rejoice with hope in song.
from God's holy word this morning comes from Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, beginning in verse 35, continuing to the end of the chapter. Please give attention to the reading of God's holy word. On that day when evening had come, he, that is Jesus, said to them, his disciples, let us go across to the other side. Leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so that the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke and rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who then is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. You may be seated. Father, we sang just a moment ago that your word is mighty. And we see now in this text, just in its uh, most superficial and surface level reading, that it is indeed mighty. Mightier than maybe any of us in this room could imagine. We would pray for that word that steeled the sea of Galilee and hushed the blowing wind to be the word that comes now through the power of the Holy Spirit into the hearts and lives of us in this room. 
that maybe hearts would be stilled and hushed in your presence as we behold the glory of the living God. Come and meet us now in Mark chapter 4 and have your way in the hearts of all of us here in this room. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you are joining us for the first time this morning, you're in the middle of a series that began in the, the, the fall of 2020 that we picked up again at the beginning in January of 2021 and now find ourselves a quarter of the way through this great gospel, this gospel of Mark. We are making our way verse by verse, uh, chapter by chapter through this remarkable gospel, a gospel that has been, I think, appropriately uh, cited as Peter's uh, oral account of his uh, life and ministry alongside Jesus. This is Peter's eyewitness account that Mark took up uh, the pen for and of which we have the privilege of being able to read his first uh, hand account. Now as you might expect with Peter, it's um, it's a brief account. It's, it's a quick moving, fast uh, narrative, emphasizing in, in many ways action r- rather than, than thought and word. And we certainly see in this story a powerful action of the Lord Jesus Christ and appropriately ordered uh, when you look at Mark and its structure as a gospel. It is 16 chapters long, which means that as we come to the end of chapter 4, we're 25% of our way, a quarter of our way through uh, this gospel. And it's appropriate that at this point we need a reminder. What is this gospel all about? Well, the main question that this gospel is trying to answer is the question, who is Jesus? Now that's the question that's actually going to be answered by that very Peter who is the oral tradition behind the writing of Mark's gospel in chapter 8 of Mark, smack dab middle of the book of Mark. We're going to have the question posed to Peter, who do people say that I am? Jesus asking and querying of Peter, what are the rumors? What's the scuttlebutt about who I am out there in the world? And he rattles off a couple of suggestions that he hears and then ultimately answers the question as to who Jesus is, that he is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now, now when we get to that point in the Gospel of Mark in chapter 8, it's a turning point, and we rush very quickly towards the final days of Jesus' life. And in fact, uh, from chapter 8 to the end of chapter 16, we're encompassing just a few weeks of Jesus' life. But these first sections are giving us a snapshot, a glimpse of the three-year ministry of Christ leading up to that final couple of weeks, both leading to the cross and the resurrection. And so it's appropriate at this quarter of the way point that we are reminded what is this gospel all about. And we see that question given to us in verse 41 of the text. Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? It's the question of this gospel. It's being voiced again here in chapter 4. That's part of what we want to ask when we approach this text this morning. Who is uh, Jesus? And we want to go a little bit further in that question by actually raising um, what I think is the main theme of this text, which is the question of, uh, of do we trust him based upon who we know him to be? If we have his identity, who he is, can we trust him because as you can see the question that's posed to the disciples is why are you so afraid have you still no faith a question of faith is the main theme of this story in verses 35 to 41 can we trust Jesus once we know it is who he is and so as we look at this text together and consider it I want to do so in In three ways. I want to look first at what I believe is a dynamic in the center of this text. And that is the relationship of faith and fear. The relationship of faith and fear. 
And then I think you'll see as we consider the dynamic relationship between faith and fear, generally speaking, that secondly, the point that this text wants to draw out is what are the false beliefs within our fears? Our fears actually have beliefs. And what are the false beliefs that are embedded within our fears? And we see them portrayed here in the disciples. And then thirdly, we want to see what is the great calm that is available to us in salvation? What is the great calm that's available to us in salvation. So the relationship of faith and fear. What are the hidden fears and false, or the false beliefs within our fears? And what is the great calm that's available to us in salvation? So I'm going to start with this, the relationship of faith and fear. And I want you to see, first of all, that faith is spread throughout every area of life. We live in a day and time where faith is sometimes considered compartmentalized, like you're a person of faith. And I am a person of reason or a person of, of science. And th those are uh, considered opposites of each other, as if a person of faith doesn't use reason or utilize science or observation, as if a person of reason and science doesn't uh, utilize faith. If you find yourself in any dialogue like that where someone says, oh, well, you're a person of faith, I'm a person of reason, you should ask them, well, why do you have faith in your reason? You see, you're trusting your mind. On what grounds do you trust your mind? Well, I have faith that I can reason through things. I trust my mind. Well, I don't trust every mind. I don't know about you. There are some minds not worthy of our trust in this world. I've engaged a few. You've probably engaged a few. There are a few minds I wouldn't want to trust. To be honest, I wouldn't always trust my own mind. I need something greater than even my own mind to be able to trust. You see, whether we're talking about reason or science or we're talking about faith, we're, we're always talking about some level of faith. Faith is at the fundamental level of every area of life. Let me just spell it out for you practically. I mean, you have a certain level of faith. Maybe this morning as you sit here that your boss tomorrow morning is not going to fire you when you show up. Now, for some of you in this room, that you have a strong sense of faith based upon a, a lot of evidence. And for others of you, you have less faith based upon markers and evidences. Uh, some of you, when you wake up tomorrow morning, uh, have, have strong faith that your spouse is not going to serve you divorce papers uh, instead of breakfast. Uh, uh, others of you are, are, are not as confident on that matter based upon uh, a number of markers and evidences in your life. Some of you have, have high faith that those politicians who were elected in this previous uh, election cycle will hold true to their promises over the next four years. Uh, others of you um, have very little faith that those who were elected will hold true to your promises. And some of you are like, I hope they don't hold true to their promises. Some of you are thinking along those lines. What does it take for our faith in any area of our life to either be strengthened, like to grow, or for it to be shattered. And I'd like to suggest to you a change in circumstances. Especially as it relates to areas of life. So, so you're pretty confident that you're not going to be fired. But when you get to staff meeting tomorrow morning, you're going to learn that earnings were down by two-thirds in your company. And catastrophic downsizing is about to happen. And following the closing of staff meeting, you will all of a sudden feel a diminished amount of faith that you're going to be sticking around in the year to come. New revelation, shifts in circumstances, either increases or decreases our faith with regards to particular areas of our lives. So let's say said spouse actually gets up earlier and cooks you the most marvelous breakfast and even serves it to you in bed. This is probably not the day of your divorce. You have good evidences, markers in what is taking place that increases your faith that your marriage is in a better place uh, maybe than even you realized. Two very general principles can be observed if we just pay attention to the relationship between faith and the lack of faith or the way faith and fear relate to one another. A positive change in your circumstances in a particular area of your life increases your faith. And a negative change in your circumstances in a certain area of your life decreases your faith. And proportionally, when your faith is decreased, what is increased? 
fear. And, and, and proportionally, when, when, when fear is increased, what is decreased? Faith. There's a relationship there. Jesus actually teaches us. You don't have to take my word for it. Look at what he says there in verse 40. The key verse that he presses in exposingly on the hearts of the disciples. He says to them, why are you so afraid? Fear is full. They're full of it. Their pulse is quickened. Their breathing is labored. They're stressing out. Why are you so afraid? So guess what? Have you still no faith? Faith is diminished. If I were to say to you, I am full of faith and stressed out, it would strike you as odd. They they are not compatible realities. One must increase, the other must decrease. And as the other increases or decreases, the other does the opposite. Why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Now, there's a qualifier here. This is true when earthly circumstances are in view. When earthly circumstances are in view. We're looking at this very horizontally at the moment. But let me paint the picture of the text for you for a second and then ask a few questions. When the disciples started out across the Sea of Galilee, everything was fine. The wind was light. The water was calm. It was near sunset. It was in the evening. From all outward indications, it was going to be a fabulous time to set sail across the beautiful Sea of Galilee. But as is sometimes the case in the Sea of Galilee, especially if you know something about the, uh, the atmospheric changes that happen in that part of the country and the mountains in and around the Sea of Galilee, you, you may be aware that the cool air in the evening will sometimes come down from those mountains and, and hit that warm, moist air that's rising up from the Sea of Galilee in a severe, um, almost spontaneous storm can develop uh, over the sea. That's what happens to the disciples. Dark clouds form. The sea becomes choppy. The wind is blowing. They shorten their sail. They get ready for what may be a little bit of a bumpy ride. Uh, Things get more severe. They drop the sail entirely. They're holding on to the things on deck. Now the choppiness has turned into waves. Waves are crashing over the side of the boat. And we're told in the text that the boat is filling up with water. Now let me ask you, is your breathing heavy at this moment? Has your pulse quickened? Yes, it has. Is Jesus saying that you're wrong if that happens? I don't think so. I don't think he's saying that a fearful or threatening situation should never cause within the emotional and physical circumstances of an individual, signs of anxiety or fear. There are certain phenomenological realities that we as human beings experience instantaneously without thought. If someone slams on the brakes in your car and almost runs into the person in front of you, do you gasp? And does your heart skip a beat? Were you not faithful to God? Did you not think that he would protect you? No! No! It's a part of the natural physiologically uh, structure of the human being. I don't think Jesus is saying we shouldn't ever experience any of those realities with regards to fear. No, Jesus is expressing something I think much deeper than that. What Jesus sees in the relationship between fear and faith is that inside those fears of the disciples are false beliefs. False beliefs that he wants to expose and indeed have been exposed. By the crisis of the storm. That brings us to point two. The false beliefs within our fears. I'd like to suggest there are two false beliefs that are given to us here in Mark chapter 4 that you can see. One is a false belief about power and threat. And another is a false belief about love and care. Both of these you see in the text. Notice this. Once disciples awake Jesus to come and help them with the predicament that they find themselves in, he does something that I would suggest is completely unexpected. I don't think that they went to Jesus to to say, hey, come and speak to the wind and the waves so that this will all calm down. No, based upon their response at the end, they're so shocked by what he did, it wasn't in their range of imaginings that he would have such a solution to their predicament. No, he... 
probably like all of the other of the disciples, uh, they were wanting him to come help them hold things on deck and not be sleeping in the stern of the boat in the midst of their crisis. And it was sort of a gritted teeth reality for the disciples at that point. But then as Jesus wakes up, he goes out and we're told what? He rebukes the wind and the waves. Strong word in the Greek. It actually is a word that we use to describe calling out sin. A a, a word that speaks to the disordered nature of nature in this particular circumstance. That nature is not like it ought to be. Nature now storms. That's not the way God originally created nature. To destroy nature or to be destructive of itself. He rebukes the wind and the waves by saying, Peace, be still. And a supernatural calm rests over everything. And at this moment, the disciples become absolutely relieved. Not at all. They realize they've misunderstood the power and the threat. We're told in verse 41, the disciples were filled with great fear. It's meant to be in contrast to the previous verse where we're told that what happens is a great calm. A great calm has fallen over, except that the calm outside is not reflective of what's going on inside the hearts and the lives of the disciples. They are now eaten up with an even greater fear. The irony is that earlier in the stories, the the disciples are overwhelmed at the threat of the loss of their life by wind and waves. But now by the end of the story, the disciples are overcome by a greater fear, a, a greater power, a power that was with them in the boat the whole time. And they didn't know it. Something much more powerful Sleeping like a baby in the stern of the boat. Yes, isn't it something of an ironic twist in the text? That they move from being afraid of what's outside the boat to being afraid of what's inside the boat. Now, of course, the threat is is now revealed to them that That which was the storm outside that could take their life is nothing compared to the threat of what's inside the boat who in a moment, if desired, could take their life. Who is this? That the sea and the wind obey him. That all of the created order has been spawned from his lips. The one who spoke and there was wind. The very first time in Genesis chapter 1. And the one who spoke and said, let there be water. And there was water and seas. And they were formed with the dry land. Is of course the one who can say hush to the sea. He's the one who made the seas. He's the one who created them in the first place. Is he not the one who will control them by the word of his power? If he brought them into power and reality by his word, will he not control them? By his word. Yes, the disciples are beginning to realize they're dealing with a power much greater than a storm. That was really not that which they should be afraid of. It doesn't exactly settle their nerves. It gives them, we might say, a deeper appreciation for the power that's with them. Maybe the power that's with us. They move from a panicky fear to what we might call, biblically speaking, the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord, a holy fear, a reverent fear. Who is this that commands the wind and the waves and they obey him? Who is this? Rudolf Otto in 1923 uh, wrote a, a book entitled The Idea of the Holy. It became a classic when he wrote it in the 20s. It's still revisited often in seminary classes. Otto trying to describe the fear of the Lord, the kind of fear that Isaiah experienced when he was in the throne room of God and God's glory was revealed and his train of his robe filled the entirety of the temple. And Isaiah said, I am undone 
by this vision. And I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell among a people of unclean lips. He was completely exposed by the glory that was revealed, something of what will happen to the disciples on the Mount of Transfiguration, which we will get to in just a number of months from now. But Otto, trying to describe the experience, chose three Latin words. Mysterium, Tremendum, and Fascinans. He says, the fear of the Lord has a mystery to it. It's being in the presence of a being so great and so holy other that we are literally put in our place by its presence. Tremendum, because it's tremendous, from which we get the word, the feeling of awe or majesty or power, that not only is this presence here and mysterious and holy other, but that it could destroy us if necessary. That we are in the palm of its hand and we are utterly at its mercy. And fascinates because we're attracted to it. In spite of being repelled by it. We're afraid of it and yet want to move towards it. We're like a moth to flame in the midst of wanting to relate to it and wanting to go cower in the closet at the same time. It's the words of Peter on the Mount of Transfiguration when as soon as the glory of Jesus is revealed, he hits the ground and falls prostrate and, and prays to the Lord and then later says, it's good that we are here. Which is it, Peter? Uh-huh. It's both of those things. The reality of God's holiness and His presence, the glory for this moment, the veil is pulled back. And the disciples begin to realize that they are not to be afraid of the storm, but actually the true identity, waking up to the true identity of Jesus is learning to have reverence for the Lord of the storm. The Lord of the storm. That above our circumstances that cause us fear, there is a greater power at play. A being who is mysterious, who is powerful, who is deserving of our respect, our honor, and our allegiance. Do you see, they had held false beliefs about what the real threat was. Where the real power was. And Jesus, in the moment of mere verbal words, speaks and the world changes. And they realize where real power comes. But not only do we see that the disciples had false beliefs about power that are being exposed by Jesus' questioning, we also see they have false beliefs about, his, about love. Specifically, Jesus' love, God's love, God's care. In the drama of the story, and there's a lot of drama in this story, isn't there? Did you miss the opening sentence? It's easy to run past. Look at verse 35. On that day that they're heading out, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. Now, don't miss that important detail. It was Jesus who directed the disciples to get into the boat and go to the other side. And the disciples didn't come up with this idea. They didn't think this was just a great time to go set sail. This was Jesus who actually led them, so to speak, in one way of communicating it, led them into this predicament. He is the one through whom has called them into the midst of the storm. He, they are the ones in obedience to his word and instruction find them in a life-threatening situation. It's Jesus who had led them here. And you can catch the fact that they're a little, well, more than a little, uh, perturbed maybe by this. It's hard to say exactly all that's going on in the disciples' heart, but you certainly, well, you catch a bit of an allegation, a shocking one, don't you, in verse 38? Teacher... Do you not care that we are perishing? <laughs> Don't you want to wince a little bit when you hear that question? Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? You can almost hear some subtext maybe by some of the disciples. You know, we're only here because you told us to come here. I mean, we're just following you and we find ourselves in the middle of the Sea of Galilee about to die. Do you care that we are perishing? Now listen. Uh, many of us do foolish things and get ourselves in all kinds of storms of our own making because of our sin and our wickedness and our foolishness. This, this is not that moment. 
This is the moment where you have walked right into a storm by being faithful to what God has called you to. And God is the source of the storm. He's leading you into the midst of the storm. Now, that's really important to see because I think in in the midst of this, the disciples are questioning based upon what they're experiencing whether Jesus cares about them. Let's be honest, it doesn't look like he does. On the surface, while all the disciples are running around doing his bidding, you know, there is entourage. He's the... Celebrity preacher, uh, they are the lowly staff, and he's, he's riding in the boat. He's sleeping on his cushion in the stern while they're just taking care of everything on top while a storm sinks the boat. I mean, that's the situation that the disciples find themselves in. It doesn't feel like Jesus cares. Just if we're using our eyes and observing what takes place, it's as if Jesus, well, the irony that he's asleep, he's asleep in the stern of the boat. Mark tells us he's on a cushion. Mark is the only gospel writer that tells us he's on a cushion. He wants us to know that. He's not only asleep on the boat, he's comfortably asleep on the boat. As the whole world around them comes crumbling down. Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? Are you you picking up what I'm putting down here? It's almost like Jesus isn't even worried about the storm. It's almost like he's not even worried about it. That he could sleep right through it. That he had no fear in the midst of a life-threatening storm. I'd like to suggest that's exactly what is meant. (laughs) He's not the least bit afraid of the storm. He's not the least bit afraid of the storm. Hold your hat. The storm is not a big deal for Jesus. Which is really where Jesus is wanting to lead his disciples all the way through this text. Ultimately getting them to a place where they realize and recognize. What you need, my friends, is the great calm of my salvation. The calm of my salvation that is found not by controlling outward circumstances. So that you never find yourself in a difficult place. But that in the midst of life-threatening circumstances... You have the Lord of the storm right there with you. The one who can speak to the wind and the waves in a moment. And it's like glass and a glorious hush comes over it all. The great calm of saving faith. Whereas Jesus is beginning to say to his disciples, listen, don't you begin to get it? Your question is not only ridiculous, it's it's insulting. Teacher, do you care that we are perishing? Oh, if you only knew, disciples, how much I care. I care so much for you that my care for you doesn't go to mere physical survival on the Sea of Galilee. I have come not to be sure that you have a few more days on planet Earth. I have come to secure for you an eternal and abundant life that will far outlive the grave. You are worried about dying here. I have come to ensure that you will never die. You will never die. I have come with resurrection power. The love of the Father is this. For God so loved the world. That he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him shall not what? Perish. Teacher, do you care? Do you care that we are perishing? Do 
Do you see what Jesus is leading all of us to? What Mark wants us to see beautifully in the text of Scripture today is that we are so worried about the tightening of the financial belt in our homes. And that terminal illness, it's terrible. And the challenge of the storms that rage in our culture and in our nation. And we say to the Lord, do you not care that I'm perishing? Do you see? It's no no different. No different in the context. And it's as if he wants to say to you, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? Have you still no faith? It's what he's saying to us. Why are you so afraid? You live in a world where Jesus Christ, the Savior and Lord over all, came back from the grave and is victorious over your last and final enemy and has defeated the evil one of which no grave can hold you if you are in Christ. Which is why Paul can say, to live, well, if I have to, okay. But to die, oh no, that would be gain. I would be in the presence of the resurrected and ascended Lord. Oh, that would be gain for me. That's where I have laid up treasures, is in heaven. A place where moth and rust can't destroy. A place where thieves can't break in and steal. I know my life here is fading. I know that it's a matter of time before it's gone. But I also know that the life that is my life in Christ is forevermore. That's where I'm focused. That's where my faith is. Listen, in the midst of a stormy time, we just got out of a Sunday school class, enduring faith in turbulent times, in the midst of a stormy time, are your eyes on the power of the storm or on the power of the Lord of the storm? Is your eyes focused upon the keeping of an earthly kingdom? Are you living for the eternal one? The only one that lasts. Have you laid up treasures in heaven? And are you beginning to find that the things of the world are growing strangely dim? Or have you created a nest egg here? And you're stressed out. Because the kingdom that you're really living for is being exposed by the fear. That right now is encompassing your heart. Jesus is calling us to something deeper. He's calling us, you see, to live not by sight, but by faith. By faith. Go ahead and take inventory. Just briefly. What's causing you stress? What's causing you anxiety? Where's where's your fear manifesting itself most deeply? Now bring it into relationship to all that we've learned today. If you're in Christ, I'd like to suggest that that has been put in its place. And if you can receive the truth of the gospel in faith today and realize that the Lord of the storm has taken the storm on the cross and he has said, silence to everyone who has anything on you. And the record is clean. And the future is bright. And nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus, your Lord. You hear that? That's called great calm. That's what that's called. That's him saying, peace. Be still. See what is real. Take it in. Walk by it. He's calling us to trust the Lord of the storm. So let's do so. Father in heaven, we would ask right now by your spirit that you would grant us the ability. And we need the ability. We need this as a gracious gift from you. The ability to believe the words that you have spoken to us today in truth. And for the word that is your word to be louder than the fears and the anxieties, both from without and from within. Might we find today a hushed, wonder-filled fear of the Lord 
that is full of faith and trust in you as we stare out at an uncertain time that looks a lot like that Sea of Galilee in our passage. And as we look into our own lives with its shaky foundations and we realize that underneath it all is a rock that never moves. Would you give us that firm footing even now in our souls as we continue to worship you in spirit and in truth? We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing. Sons and daughters of the living God, what is it that you believe? We believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and then sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, from whence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. You may be seated. All but the Westerbeeks, if you would please come forward this morning. What a joy to welcome a dear brother in the Lord to the Lord's table today. Josh Westerbeek comes um, as he has made a profession of faith and has been examined uh, by our elders uh, to come to the Lord's table for the very first time. You guys just come right on around. Come right on around. Um, we get the joy today to celebrate uh, that Lord's Supper with Josh and uh, to rejoice in what the Lord has been doing in his heart uh, and in his life. And one of our ruling elders, Randy Allen, got the chance to spend some time uh, with Josh, got to share with us a little bit about his testimony uh, when we met this last Tuesday night. And so, Josh, we are thrilled that you're here, and we look forward to welcoming you to the Lord's table together with the rest of the family of God here. Uh, Randy, tell us a little bit about your time with Josh. Certainly. Uh, Cornerstone family, this is the Westerbeeks, a new yes. family that's joined. And um, when they had their interview, I got to uh, talk with Josh here. And Josh has been a follower of Jesus for, uh, for a little while now. And he wanted to come and uh, have communion with our Lord. And so he got to tell me his love for Jesus. And now he recognizes his uh, sinfulness and that mm -hmm. um, he trusts in Jesus and Jesus alone for his salvation. And so let's welcome him as a, as a brother coming to have communion together. With us. Amen. Praise the Lord, Josh. We rejoice in God's work in you and in the Westerbeek family. Welcome to Cornerstone. We are delighted to have you here. As we prepare to come to the Lord's Supper, let's remember the words that Jesus spoke. That on the night that he was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. He gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup also and said, This is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for many. Drink ye all of it in remembrance of me. 
as we have confessed our faith just previous to coming to the Lord's table, we now have confidence to the things that we have professed that now we can come to a Savior who meets us by the Holy Spirit right here at the table to renew our faith and confidence that the God who has made promises to us and redeemed us in Christ will hold true to those promises for Josh and for all who trust in faith in Christ. Let's pray to that end right now. Father in heaven, uh, we would pray that you would encourage and strengthen us as today we celebrate this sacrament of the Lord's Supper. What is called a means of grace in your church throughout the generations, a, a means by which you commune with us. Make your presence known. Grow us in the fear and the admonition of you. Transferring us over and over. Increasingly sanctifying us into the likeness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, today as we welcome Josh to the Lord's table and the rest of this body and family who come to commune, we pray that you would strengthen his heart and soul in this sacrament. And that this day of his partaking would be simply the first among a lifetime of communion with you. Lord, that you would lead him week in and week out to this table as a means by which to refresh and renew his commitment to you. But greater still, your commitment to him. Until that day when he and all of us in Christ eat and drink of this fruit of the vine, new in the Father's kingdom. Oh, what a day that will be. Prepare us now for it, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll be led by our ushers this morning as we come to the Lord's table row by row. Come, welcome to his table. Josh.
Would you pray with me? Lord, your word tells us that you are enthroned upon the praises of your people, that you inhabit our worship. We thank you for your presence here, Lord, and ask that you make us ever aware of that truth, that it's only through your spirit that our eyes might be opened. You are holy and there is no one like you. You alone are the great light that shines, that breaks through the darkness. You alone are the calm that brings peace in the midst of storms. We confess we're easily distracted by what we deem as urgent, how we easily, we too, feel overwhelmed like the disciples in the middle of the sea with waves crashing in. Could it be, Lord, that perhaps these circumstances are right where we're supposed to be, that our false beliefs might be exposed and we might be reminded that you are the promise keeper? Lord, we pray for those in our Cornerstone family who do feel life pressing in on them in very real ways, be it physical hardships, health issues, financial worries. Would you bring peace, Lord, to those with health complications? Would you bring healing? Would you, our one true hope, bring peace? We pray for our broader community here in Franklin and for those missions we support here in the Mid-State, nationally, and even around the globe. We pray that your name, Jesus, uh, would be known, would be lifted up. We pray for our nation. As we look around our nation right now, Lord, it's so d divisive. We see evidence of the fall all around us. Would you teach us how to love those in our midst? Would you teach us and show us how to be light in darkness? We pray for our, our leaders, local, state, and national leaders, Lord. We pray that you would give them wisdom. Thank you, Lord, that communion with you was of such great importance that you gave your disciples and us words to say by praying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's stand and sing.
before we receive the Lord's benediction, just a reminder that we will exit row by row uh, this morning, beginning in the back of the sanctuary and making our way all the way to the front. Now let's receive the Lord's blessing from 2 Peter chapter 3. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Thank you.